Yeah, well, I resonate with the idea of giving. Uh, I mean, I found that true happiness comes from serving humanity mm. in from very small to maybe more significant projects. And But the idea is that if you're giving, you're getting. Have you ever experienced something so crippling in your life that has made you feel broken? I have. Are you someone who has a giving heart but is struggling to feel good themselves? Are you consistently putting your needs aside to take care of everyone else? If so, you're not alone. Giving starts with giving to yourself so that you are able to give of yourself to other people. Isn't it time you took back control and discovered what makes you tick? Join me in my journey and find out how you can feel better about yourself, live your best life, and share that with others. Thinking of yourself, it doesn't make you selfish. It makes you brave. I'm Nelia, and this is the Giving Starts With You podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Giving Starts With You podcast. I'm your host, Nelia Hutt. Thank you so much for joining me again and my new special friend, Doug Knoll, today. How are you, Doug? I'm well, Nelia. How are you? You know, it's I'm really happy. It's been a few days since I've done an interview and I have missed connecting with people like you. Ah. And honestly, <laughs> I just, it's amazing what kind of relationships you can start over the internet, you know, like it always, it always amazes me, but welcome to the show. So I'm very excited to get started. I'm going to let everybody know a little bit about Doug. So Douglas E. Knoll, JD, left a successful career as a trial lawyer to become a peacemaker. Love this. His calling is to serve humanity and he executes his calling on so many levels. He is an award-winning author, teacher, trainer, and highly experienced mediator. Doug's work carries him from international work to helping people resolve deep interpersonal and ide ideological conflicts to training life inmates to be peacemakers and mediators in maximum security prisons. So, of course, we're going to have to ask him a little bit more about that. Doug is the co-founder of Prison of Peace and creator of the Null Effect Labeling System. In 2012, he was honored by California Lawyer Magazine as California Attorney of the Year. And today I've got, I've invited Doug and I'm so happy he said yes. I've invited him to talk about de-escalating situations, um, you know, he's so passionate about the power of listening to emotions and not just words, which fascinates me. And I think that we're all going to learn a lot from him today. So thanks again, Doug, for coming on and, and sharing us, you know, sharing your time with us. Well, you're welcome. So, you know, the typical first question, tell me a little bit about, you know, <laughs> who you are that we haven't heard already from the intro. So <clears throat> I'm 71 years old. Uh, I was I feel more, I like I'm more like about 45, but my phys biological age, maybe my physical age is that my biological age is 45. Um, I was born pretty severely disabled in Southern California. I was born with two club feet, um, almost blind, partially deaf, bad teeth, left handed, just a lot of problems. And in 1950, when I was born, people didn't know how to deal with children like me. If you didn't, if you if you didn't come out perfect, then you know people just didn't know how to accommodate it. Especially somebody who couldn't walk until he was three and was left-handed. So the typical traje trajectory of sports and athleticism for me was very very difficult. But I I managed, although my emotional upbringing, I, I grew up in in uh, privilege and, and abundance, but my emotional I lived in an emotional desert because my parents just really didn't know how to support me. And they, like many people, believe that I had to be tough to work through stuff. And so I covered up all of that emotional hurt with arrogance. And I was born with a superior intellect. So I was a smart ass too. <laughs> Anyways, I ended up getting accepted and attending uh, Dartmouth College an Ivy League school in New Hampshire. And 
then after graduating, came back and a year later entered law school. And I went to law school not because I wanted to become a lawyer necessarily. I just wanted to, I just wanted to become a better thinker, a critical thinker. And law school is really good at, at teaching you how to do that. So, but, but so the, the trajectory just sort of took an inertia of its own. I graduated high in my class, was on the law review, all that kind of stuff, and so I was able to secure a one-year position working for an appellate judge in Central California, and decided that I like the area because it's, I love the mountains. Right now I live about 60 miles south of Yosemite National Park on 10 acres. And it's really just a beautiful place to live. And so after, after that year, I joined uh, a firm locally here in Central California as a young associate, and they groomed me to be a trial lawyer. And I joined the firm in September of 1978 and tried my first jury trial two months later in November of 1978, which is unheard of. And then a month later, I found myself in San Diego co-chairing the defense of a $36 million securities fraud case in federal court in San Diego. And that's how, that's how I started my career. And I, for the next 22 years, that's what they did. I tried lawsuits, commercial business and commercial cases, usually complex, usually involving a lot of money. Um, so that's really what got started. Now, how I got into peacemaking is sort of a, a is an interesting story too, because in, in the mid eighties, I took up the martial arts okay. and I was awarded my second degree black belt right around the time I turned 40 years old, 1990 thereabouts. And my teacher called me and said, you're fired. <laughs> I'm not going to teach you anymore until you master Tai Chi. So you're arrogant. You're kind of an asshole. You're mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, said, so you need to go learn Tai Chi. So I did. I started studying Tai Chi, and Tai Chi has two interesting paradoxes. One is the softer you are, the stronger you are. And the other is the more vulnerable you are, the more powerful you are. Oh, I love that. Soft to be strong, vulnerable to be powerful. Yeah, well, I, it didn't compute for me because I was a warrior, you know, trial lawyer, trial warrior, martial arts warrior, you know. Yes. <laughs> I didn't get any of that stuff. But it did, what happened was that it seeped into my soul as I continue to practice Tai Chi. Tai Chi is also a very vicious martial art. I studied as a martial art, not as a contemplative practice. Anyways, in the mid nineties, I was in the courtroom trying a case and the thought came to me, what the heck am I doing in here? And after that trial, I went on a river trip and kind of reevaluated everything and came back saying, I'm not gonna do this trial work anymore. But I really didn't know what I was gonna do, except that serendipitously, I mean, the universe always provides, right? I was driving down the mountains to my office and I heard the, what turned out to be the one and only public service announcement for a new master's degree in conflict resolution and peacemaking being offered at Fresno Pacific University. And that caught my attention. And so I inquired and did my investigation and decided this might be an interesting project. And they were trying to decide whether or not they wanted to have a mid-career trial lawyer in their midst, the Mennonites, you know, the peace church. <laughs> yes. So, but we all we decided we would accommodate each other and, and see what what happened. So, so that's what I did. I, I earned my master's degree in peacemaking and conflict studies, wow. and uh, then and while I was in that pro, it was a huge growth process for me, really a huge experience intellectually, and. I had discussions with my partners about what I wanted to do, and they were quite unhappy that I wanted to not try cases because I was carrying half the firm financially and the second largest money earner, and they weren't happy to see the goose with dropping the golden eggs stop yeah. laying eggs, right? Exactly. So the upshot was that I gave them a week's notice and left, left $10 million on the table and walked out. A week? Wow. A week. <laughs> just walked out and had it what was it about that day doing the trial like what was it that you'd had enough of like what well was... as i thought about it and as i think about it today i was getting really tired of the fighting mm. there is no peace in in trial work you're fighting you're fighting your clients to get paid they don't want to pay you mm. you're fighting the court of course you're fighting you've got adversaries 
defense counsel and defendants or plaintiffs, depending on which side of the case you're on. You've got... Um, so everybody you know, dislikes you. Everybody, for... there is no peace. It's a, a constant, constant fight. Mm. And I just didn't want to do that anymore. Okay. I was tired of it. I just, I I'd, won, I'd had a very successful career. I won some big cases. I lost some big cases. I mean, I, I, you know, I did a lot as a trial lawyer. And so I didn't think that my career wasn't going to get any better than it was right then. It wasn't going to continue to improve. And, you know, and, and the other thing that really struck me, and this goes to more of the kind of work that you do, is that I asked myself on that river trip, how many people had, had really served as a trial lawyer? How many people had I represented that actually came out of the legal system better off mm. than going in? And I could only count five clients out of hundreds. That's powerful. And I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. Mm. I'm not here just to serve a few people. And I'm not going to go 30 more years as a lawyer and only really help 20 people. So that's when I made the decision. And I didn't know what I was going to do. But that's what I decided. That's that, that's when I was pretty much committed to walking out, not doing any more trials. So how's your life improved since? Well, that was really, that was right after my 50, wait. Yeah, I walked out right after my 50th birthday. Ah. And that's when my life really started. That's when life really began. Mm, I love that. That's amazing. It's never... It's never too late to follow what really is pu pulling you toward it, you know? Like oh, yeah, I agree. And I, I mean, I tell young people all the time, they ask me, well, how, how do I, what do I do? And I said, follow your heart. Don't worry about the money. Yeah. I used to make a lot of money. I don't make nearly as much money now as I used to, but I don't care. I've got money is, money is meaningless. <laughs> <Comes and goes. laughs> you got to pay your bills. But I mean, you know, it, 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 if you really want happiness, don't chase the dollar, chase, chase goodness. Mm, I love that. And I can imagine that you have helped, you know, in the first six months, you probably helped more than five people. I help. Yeah, I help more people in a week <laughs> these days than I helped in 22 years as a trial lawyer. Love that. But you know what, everything brings us to to a place where you learn so many skills, though, as a trial lawyer that has now you've been able to, you know, deescalate and do all the things that you're doing. Like, well, the de-escalation I actually de discovered and developed in 2005, after I, after I left the practice of oh, law. Oh, okay. Um, one of the problems that you have as a mediator, mm -hmm. as you might well imagine, is when you're being called into somebody else's conflict, you're dealing with very strong emotions. And I didn't have any good tools for, for working with strong emotions. I my, As great as my master's degree studies were nobody nobody not only my mentors but just about everywhere else no one all they had was the old active listening crap that thomas gordon developed in the 1950s using i statements which doesn't work no, never has that. worked never will work you said something earlier on really powerful and you called it the emotional desert and just when you said it like that like when you were that people didn't really know how to deal with you when you had when you oh, were yeah. a child, and you have all all of these things going on. That doesn't really prepare you no. <laughs> to have this life where not only you feel good about yourself, but you feel good about other people. Because if nobody's treating you with kindness and love or safety, yes, then, emotional safety, exactly. Then, yeah, I just. I can see over the years, like I can see you being in the courtroom, not knowing you, but I can just feel that, that moment when you're like, I just don't want to feel like that anymore. That is huge. Yeah. Then you start to heal yourself before you can help. Like this podcast is all about how we need to take care of ourselves before we can help other people. And until you realize that moment, you're not feeling, you know, you weren't feeling fulfilled or aligned with what you really wanted to do. You couldn't really help anybody. Right. Well, that, cool. yes and no. I mean, I could certainly help people as a lawyer and give legal advice and be, and be the legal person. But, but in terms of living an integrated life where, where my all aspects of my life, my spiritual, physical, intellectual and emotional lives were all aligned and integrated, that was that did not occur until I left the practice of law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and what I meant. That's when, right. And that allowed me leaving that environment 
mm. allowed me to start to grow. I couldn't grow in the in the in the environment of the law because it's very constraining. Mm. And uh, but once I left that environment, that was the freedom to to grow. And so I, I started growing it. At first, it was very slow, but then as I gain more skills and gain more knowledge and develop tools that we'll talk about, um, it started to accelerate. And, you know, today I'm as happy as I, I, I didn't think anybody could ever be happy as happy as I am today. It's amazing. I'm so happy. glad. And you took that chance on yourself, you know, like you, if you oh, have changed your, the, you know, just. I'm a, I'm a bit of a risk taker. Uh, <laughs> so it wasn't a huge leap. Okay. You know, I mean, I knew I knew that if things didn't work out, I could always go back to practicing law, and right. so you know, you've always got a fallback. But, but it was it was, I just knew that what what I was going to do with the new knowledge I had was going to have was going to have an effect, and be and be useful. And it, I was right. It's had a huge effect on people. So tell me about the prison for peace. Well. I left the practice of law in 2000 and 10 years later, okay. in 2009, I get a phone call from my dear friend and colleague, Laurel Coffer, who was a Los Angeles mediator and like me, an adjunct professor at Pepperdine University School of Law. And she read me a letter that she just received. In fact, she was standing at her mailbox. And the woman who wrote the letter, Susan Russo, was serving a, a life sentence without possibility of parole in the largest, most violent women's prison in the world, Valley State Prison for Women in Chowchilla, California, which happened to be about an hour from where I live. And Laurel, what Susan was asking was whether or not Laurel would be willing to come into the prison and teach the networking group, which is a group of about 100 women serving life sentences, to become mediators and peacemakers so they could stop the prison violence because they were tired of it. And, you know, they. The guards weren't doing what they're supposed to do. Is the prison had a terrible reputation. Mm -hmm. um, so Laura reads the letter to me and says, "What do you think?" <laughs> and I thought about it for about a nanosecond, and I kind of took a gulp because I kind of felt like this might be big. And I said, "Yeah, I think we should do this." So it took us six months to get permission to get in, and it, and we also had to develop a curriculum. And both Laura and I, being law professors and trainers we knew how to teach this stuff, but we made some decisions that the population that we were going to be working with probably had zero skills. Mm. So we felt that we had to teach them some basic foundational skills before we could teach them how to be mediators and peacemakers. And so that's how we developed yeah. the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And we started with 15 women in April of 2010, ages 30 to 65, all different ethnicities, different walks of life, different levels of intelligence. Uh, and within three or four weeks of us starting the program, we had a wait list of 350 women who wanted to get in because they'd heard about, from these women what was going on. So it, it, we, um, that's how it started. You know, I'm thinking about the moment where you approach or these women find out that these guys are going to take this project on. Like, somebody wrote a letter and yeah this is actually going to happen just even in that second before any change happened or anything do you know how much hope you gave them for something different that you believed in them enough well i don't i i think that came a little later because i don't know like yes but at the same time when you're i don't they know were pretty angry oh, okay group of violent women that we started with. Okay. They'd all killed somebody. And uh, they were angry that the prison officials put some women into the group that they didn't, that others didn't want. So we already immediately had a group conflict. <laughs> okay. So I take that back. I can know, just it was, it was yeah. pretty. And then, and then I, my problem was that as a, a fairly large, I'm 6'1, 220 pounds, I'm a big man, white, older gray-haired Anglo-Saxon male lawyer, I was evil incarnate to these women. Mm. Every bad thing that ever happened to them was done by somebody that looked like me. So there was a lot of, I got a big dose of humble pie and also, um, 
you know, they learned we had to do a lot of trust building and that took time. But there's some interesting stories in there. <laughs> yeah, there was, it was pretty interesting, but, but it worked. And anyway, so that's how the project started. We were pro bono for six years. Uh, and finally we got started. We were about ready to give up because we were going broke doing this. And, and we finally started getting funding from the state. And just before the, when the pandemic hit in March of 2020, we were in 15 California prisons, a prison in Connecticut, 12 prisons in Greece and startups in Northern Italy and Nairobi, Kenya. So then we had to stop in, in pr pr prison programming, obviously because of COVID. So we created, we pivoted and started doing distance learning. Uh, and then last year we got funding and we took our entire curriculum and put it on film and we're in post-production right now on that. So by the end of mid middle of this year, we'll be able to offer prison of peace to any prison in the world. Oh, that's so great. And we'll, we'll train facilitators over zoom. You don't have to know the curriculum. You just have to know how to facilitate the lessons. And, you know, we're expecting this to go worldwide over the next couple of years. Wow. And the reason that it's so powerful is that at least in California, we've probably trained over 20,000 inmates, uh, but about three or 4,000 have been released and not one of our students has ever reoffended. Really? Recidivism, right? That's incredible. Yeah. So proud. Like, that's awesome. And I'm interviewing you. And look at all the stuff you've done. This is amazing. <laughs> My life. I love it. I love <laughs> it. I'm happy that you chose to do this <laughs> on that day. But this, wow, this is fantastic. So what are some of the things you, you, you teach? Like, what are some of the tips like that we were talking about? So, on how, yeah. yeah. We, we break it into, we've, it's evolved over the years. Mm. Um, but now what we do, we, we break it into four basic workshops. And the first workshop, we teach basic listening skills, inclu which includes mirroring, paraphrasing, core messaging, and affect labeling. And affect labeling is what I had developed in 2005, this ability to reflect the emotions of other people, which calms people, angry people down very quickly. And we knew going in that we had to teach the skills that we knew worked. So um, we didn't teach active listening. We didn't teach nonviolent communication. We didn't teach any of the stuff that Alternatives to Violence in Prison teaches, which is a Quaker-based program. Mm -hmm. We taught stuff that we know that we could teach the how, how you do it, that would work first time every time without failure. Because in prison, there really is no room for failure. Mm -hmm. it's too violent. So we teach them basic listening skills and then we teach them how to, how to do peace circles. And the, and the reason we teach that is to teach them how to become leaders, how to lead a group process, because when they become peacemakers and mediators, they're, they're going to be leading a group process. So peace circles is a pretty easy way to, to develop leadership skills and to refine your listening skills and also to learn how to coach people on how to listen. Then, then the next two modules are the first one is a skills skills based. We teach people how to make durable agreements. Because when you're again, when you're a peacemaker, you, you're going to end up with an agreement and you got to know how to make an agreement that everybody's going to mm. perform. So how do you do that? Well, there are there are ways you do this to make to make it as we say, what would it be like if you could get um, 50% of the agreements you make in prison, people follow through with. Well, that would be astounding because people break, break their promises all the time. So we teach them how to, how to, how to develop a, a process for reaching agreement with, with somebody to do something that they'll, they'll be enthusiastic I'll about doing. It. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then we teach a process known as results-based listening, which is how to, how to help people solve problems without giving advice. Hmm. Because mediators don't give advice. So you have to learn how to help people solve problems, but not be directive about it. That's and so, tough to do. Yeah, there's a separate skill called re results-based listening. Then in Peacemaker 2, uh, which is really a module that I developed, how to manage strong emotions, your own strong emotions and the strong emotions of other people. And we teach them, we give them some self-development stuff on how to recognize their own emotional triggers and deprogram some of their childhood stuff. And then we teach them also, we teach them how to re, uh, how to 
re-engage the morally disengaged? How do you how do you morally re-engage somebody who's morally disengaged? Which of course is quite common in prison. I was going to say that's a tough one. And well, there's techniques for it, and so we teach the how of how to do that, and then we teach them. We take the peace circle concept and move it up a level. How do you use the peace circle for conflict resolution? And then once they get through all of that, they're ready for the, for our mediation workshop, which is a three day, eight hour intensive workshop learning the steps of what is known as interest-based mediation. And when they get through all of that and they've done all the homework, we certify them as mediators. And as a result, in that first prison, for example, we got an unsolicited, unsolicited letter from the warden um, saying that because of prison of peace, Valley State Prison of Women is no longer a violent prison. Wow. Completely changed. Oh my goodness. It's giving me goosebumps, you know, because yeah. underneath all that toughness are, are people, you know, people who, I don't know. I just, sometimes I know you said they were all, um, you know, murderers. Um, and it's a fine line, you know, but there's still people. Like they're still, I don't know. <laughs> they, there, there is there. Uh, I will tell you this with one exception, <laughs> only one. Oh. There's not one of those people that I've taught personally trained in all the prisons that I've been in that I wouldn't have at my dinner table. Yeah. Everybody's worth saving, you know, and it just, maybe it's, I don't even think it's, about worse. I don't think yeah. the word saving is right. I think right. that what, I, what I've learned is that when you teach people mm. foundational skills of life that allow them to get in touch with their own humanity and develop their own emotional competency, they naturally grow and evolve into decent human beings. And that's exactly what we experienced. Yeah, I think you're uh, absolutely right. That was the wrong word. I just sometimes I can't find the, the right words, you know, but it's just sometimes you're just not modeled certain things like well, cool. no you're right you know and you're you just don't have people that you can look to that show you anything different and so of course you know sometimes people say oh my goodness how did you, well how did you not end up in prison you know what i mean like well yeah i i say murderers are not bred they're born i mean murders are not born they're bred yeah all of these people every single one of them came out as a baby ready to learn and they learned violence because that's what their families taught them yeah i can just imagine the transformation stories that you've seen from some of these you know inmates to at the end when they're holding these leadership you know circles and and they're doing the mediation it's just i wish i could have been there to see it you know it's just like i can it's like, oh my God, you get your, your life back in a way for them as well. Even though you're incarcerated, right. you feel free in a way because you That's... actually know who you are. You yeah. know that you're helping other people. And for these people, not, you know, a lot of them not to reoffend again, or most of them, um, it's, it's quite astonishing. Like it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, you're hitting the right points. We, our tagline is from, uh, living a, a, a sentence of life to living a life of service. Mm. And we, what we, what we do is we only work with long-termers and lifers because we want them. They're going to be there for a while for the most part. Right. And, and we tell them, this is not about self-help. This is not about you improving. This is not about you getting brownie points. This is about you serving other people as a peacemaker. And we're going to give you the tools and the training to show you exactly how to do that. So you can walk into any conflict, and get it resolved without violence. Have you had people refuse to be part of it? People, uh, we've had people drop out, of course. Okay. Uh, yeah. They, they, this is self self selection. So people okay. come into this program voluntarily. They're not forced okay. into it, and they they choose to be there. And some people will drop out because it's hard work. We work their butts off, and they're not used to that. And they're not used to being held accountable. Hmm. And we hold them accountable. And that's what keeps a lot of people in. For the first time, they're 
adults in the room holding, keep making me accountable. And if I want to be a mediator and get that certificate, I've got to work for it. Speaking right. of, I'm going to drop that. That is yeah. my partner in crime, Laurel Call for calling. <laughs> <laughs> busy, busy. That's okay. Yeah. You know, and I know we're talking about prison, but I see this program needing to be taught in schools too because well i've done that i have worked i worked in the fifth largest <laughs> school district in california the problem is oh. we got amazing results but then i never heard from the district again and i'm i school districts are under sage right now they're under political sage you know with all this crap going on in politics and they don't have the time or the money to invest in these foundational skills that change people's lives. You're absolutely right. I showed, I taught middle school and high school teachers de-escalation skills that completely changed their classroom management. Because I see it as a prevention. Completely changed their classroom management. Yeah, and I see it as a prevention to getting to prison. Well, yeah, but that's not what people are interested in. You would think also, you would also think that law enforcement agencies would be interested in this stuff. They're not. I know because I've sometimes, talked to a lot of agencies and they're just not interested. Sometimes it just comes down to the dollar, honestly, and that's not what it should be. Well, it's dollars and priorities. I mean, law enforcement agencies would rather spend money on guns and bullets than on learning how not to use guns and bullets. Hmm. I'm wondering if there's any aspect of it, maybe in the future that, you know, parents can purchase to teach their kids rather than- well, I've tried. I, I've tried that too. And I, I'm astounded at how few parents are really interested in learning these skills. They, they're 20 somethings and they think they know it all. And they can't believe that something like this, the studies are clear mm -hmm. that if you start d coaching a ch children's emotions at around age four, affect label their emotions by the, by the t five years later, nine and 10, they're usually two to three grade levels ahead of their peers academically and emotionally mature way, way, way beyond their peers. And they're better adjusted, they're, hap they're much happier, they are uh, perceived by their peers as being leaders. Mm -hmm. And this is just because the parents took the time to coach their children on how to be emotionally confident. And I think these are skills that make us who we are, like who really, like well, who build the yeah. foundation of, what we're going to do like what is the future really going to look like if if our part leaders of, don't want to you know part of the crazy. part of the, yeah part of the problem we have is a cultural problem and that is that in in western civilization we have been fed a lie for four thousand years that we're rational and the truth is from neuroscience we're 98 percent emotional and only two percent rational and even our, even when we're rational, it's bounded. It's very narrow. Every decision we make is an emotional decision. Everything we do is emotional. And yet we have been taught by theologians and philosophers that emotions are bad, emotions are evil, emotions are weak, emotions are irrational. And we've been taught to repress our emotions. Emotion, it's not safe. Emotions are not safe. And yet that's who we are. But what happens when we suppress all of these emotions? We well, blow just, up. Just, just look around you. Look yeah. at how much unhappiness there is. Look at look at all the anger that's out there right now. Look at, I mean, how many happy people do you really see in the world? Very few. Mm -hmm. And that's as a result of this mindset that we have to be rational. When we're, there's no way we can be rational because we're we're not rational beings. We're not designed that way. We're designed to be emotional. And by the way, only humans have emotions. No other animal, no other species. I swear, I look at my pug sometimes, and the way he looks at me. It, that's right. What you're seeing is you're seeing affect. That's different. Okay. Affect is a biophysiological response in the dog's brain, hmm. but it is not emotion. Emo because emotions are very different than affect. And emotions are based on affect, but they're very different. I'll never look at him the same again, Doug. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I, mean, I have a little, I have a little eight-week-old border collie, and I, oh. I, I mean, eight months. She's eight months old, and um, you know, I can read her like a book. Wow. And but it's she's not having emotional experience. She's she's having affective experiences. Mm. On on a, s a smaller scale, for me, for example, my listeners know that 
I suppressed my feelings for 12 years after my father passed away and it completely changed who I was. I became depressed, anxious, PTSD, all of this suffering because I thought it was a form of weakness and I wanted to help my mom and my brother and everybody else cope. And I want, I thought, well, if I don't talk about it, I'm going to protect myself. And wow, that I still had all the grief, but now I had all this other stuff to deal with. Right. You know? And I know that's not the same as exactly what we're talking about. It but, is. But it's, it's incredible. Parents, oh, parents gosh. destroy their children's brains by thinking they've got to be tough and, and telling them to buck up and, and yeah. be, be, don't be emotional. Don't for, men, for little boys, be a man. Don't be a girly girl yes, for girls, for, for big boys. girl communities, right? All that, it destroys the children's brains. Oh, yeah. It's it's literally crazy. destroys it. It's like, I it's mean, not physically. okay for me to feel this? Like, it's not okay for me to be angry? It's not okay for me That's to right. Be angry. It is okay. Yeah. You just have to be learn management skills. Mm -hmm. so that when you are angry, you're not reactive. So what are some of the things, like I have a teenager in the house. How what old? Some, 15. Okay. And he's got a heart of gold, but he's got a little temper too, you know? Right. <laughs> he's very right. good at negotiating, right. or he, try, he tries to negotiate a lot of things. So right. what's a good way to de-escalate? <laughs> well... The, de the basic de-escalation strategy is a three-step process. Okay. So let's say you're confronted with somebody who's very angry. Um, step number one, ignore those angry words. You heard them all before. There's no, new there's no news here, right? If we listen yeah, to the words, we're going to we're gonna get triggered, and we're, then we're going to get reactive, and then we go nowhere. So we have to learn how to just treat the words as white noise and ignore the words. And then that frees up bandwidth for us to do step number two, which is to read the emotional data fields. And you say, what's that? Well, it turns out that through evol evolutionary biology, our brains are hardwired for quickly and exquisitely accurately reading the emotions of other people. And let me explain this a little bit. What most people don't realize is that Homo sapiens was the only hominid species that ever had language. And our language developed only 230,000 years ago, just an eye blink. And interestingly, we developed the ability to speak with words at the at around the same time that we developed mastery of fire. Because once we, once we mastered fire, then we could take animal fat, render animal fat and animal protein. And that added the kind of calories that our brains needed to grow very rapidly. So over a 10,000 year period, our brains grew, and um, along with it, the pharyngeal nerve, pharyngeal muscle, and the and uh, other associated muscles and nerves that control our vocal apparatus, so that 230,000 years ago, proto languages started to evolve. Before that, no language, but there was communication. How did we communicate? We communicated through emotion, through facial expressions. And over millions and millions and millions of years, our brains became, we became selective for our ability to exquisitely understand what another person was experiencing and feeling mm -hmm. without language. Because if you could understand what your clan member was experiencing, you know, that made for tighter bonds, made for more cohesion, Absolutely. more collaboration. So we have, we still have this innate ability to read other people's emotions. And emotions are data, just like numbers on a spreadsheet. We just have to learn, we just have to allow ourselves to read and interpret the data correctly. So the way you do it, it's just empty your mind and be in stillness. And your brain will automatically and unconsciously start to process the emotions of this angry person. And emotions will start coming into your consciousness. And as that happens, the next step, which is the part that really trips people up, is you simply reflect back the emotions with a simple you statement. So I would say you're really angry, you're frustrated, you don't feel heard, you feel disrespected, you're sad, oh, you're embarrassed, you're worried, mm. you feel betrayed, you feel abandoned and unloved. The only thing I'm going to say to this angry person is 
whatever emotions they're experiencing. And I'm going to do it with a use statement hmm. because I want to, I want to reflect to them on their, from their frame of reference. That's why the Thomas Gordon stuff never worked. He got it all wrong. Um, and then you, you do this process until four things happen. One, you get a nod of the head. Two, you get a verbal response like, yeah, or exactly. Uh, you get okay. a dropping of, yeah, you get a dropping of the shoulders and you get a sigh, a sigh of relief and exhalation, all involuntary relaxation responses. And then you're done. And the whole thing takes 90 seconds or less. I can see the dropping of the shoulders. Yeah. I, you know, I'm just trying to think the other day I was having a confrontation with my son. And as soon as I think he got the fact that I was listening and caring about what he said, because the whole conversation didn't go that way. But in that moment when it went right <laughs> and it went well, you see the tears welling up and the shoulders going down. It's like, oh, my God, she gets it. You know, it's amazing. I feel like this about music because music, like you were talking about languages. So my son plays the piano, just that's the way about emotions. And sometimes when we're angry at each other and we don't really want to yell at each other or speak to each other, I say, play me how you're feeling. So he'll play very angry or very sad. Like he'll play something because sometimes the words don't come out the way that we want. So sometimes people write letters or they do different things. In our house, we play music to show our emotion. And I think it's really healthy because it's it's just like, you know, sometimes you can hear something, you can hear chanting, you can hear music that has no words or words in a completely different language and you don't understand, but you do understand. Because it's that whole thing before you have the language, if you have the emotion connected, like my life is all about music and that's why I always take this back and think of things in that way. And I think it's because of the emotion. It's the way we can connect one another as well without really having to have the perfect words and everything. But when we are in, in situations that we need to have the perfect words, I think what you laid out here is amazing. Well, it's been their brain scanning studies to support why it works the way that it does. It's the only thing that I've ever found that really works. Mm. And I wouldn't be teaching or talking about it or writing books about it if it didn't work. And, you know, I've got years, decades of field experience and experimentation showing that it does work and it's very effective. So glad you shared it with us. So ignore the angry words. Read the emotional data fields. Yes. Reflect back the emotions with a simple use statement. I'm excited. I want to try this out. I'm sure we'll have some kind of confrontation today. So I do. I want to try this out. This is. I wouldn't try it on your. I wouldn't try it on your 15 year old at first. No. What, I would, what I would do is uh, go to Starbucks. Right. And, and when you're talking to the baristas, say something like, "Oh, you're really happy today." Really low risk social situations. Okay. And and just observe what happens. Okay. And then do it with restaurant servers or do it with. Oh. Checkout clerks in the supermarket, perfect strangers, where if you make a mistake, it's not a big deal. And and just and just have a pre-planned statement. You're really happy or with the server. You might say, wow, you look really stressed and busy today, stressed out and anxious. Uh, checkout person could be happy, tired, sad, glad. You just have you just what are they? And just tell them what they are. Tell them what they are and then watch what happens. So what you're telling me is you don't have to wait for an escalated situation. No, no, never. You don't. In fact, you don't want to practice. You don't want to practice. I mean, the de-escalating angry people, that's in the deep end of the pool. Okay. You got to start by putting your little toe in the shallow end of the pool and practice a little bit and gain confidence in, the, in that this will actually work. Mm. Because it's not good enough to just hear Doug Knoll talk about it. You've got to actually experience it yourself. And when you do then you build confidence and you're ready to go a little deeper into the pool and take on something a little bit more mm -hmm. difficult. I know how it would make me feel if somebody used that on me. How do you think you would feel? Seen. Yeah. You'd I would feel seen. I'd feel heard. I'd feel understood. That's right. I call, I, that's right. I call this listening other people into existence. Oh, I love that. 
Absolutely. Yeah, this, you know, day in and day out, we walk around in this fog, you know, where we don't notice people, you know, no. I used to work for a physician years ago and it was just, you know, and it's not just a physician, but it could be anybody. And you say, oh, how are you today? Oh, how are you today? And they don't really stop to hear the answer. Right. And this particular day, this person had just lost somebody close to them and they were at the doctor's office and, you know, they were asked, how are you? And they're like, oh, I'm so terrible. It's like, good, good. Come on into my office. Like, you just don't even hear it anymore. And it's not because just we get deconditioned to these things when we're treating people and treating people and treating right. people. And I think it's really sad, but I think we all do it at some point or another. Well, we're not trained in how to listen. So, you know, we don't we don't think, again, if you, if you live in a society that thinks that humans are rational, then anything that's not rational isn't worth paying attention to. But if you live in a world where we're 98 percent emotional and only two percent rational then emotions are everything and you pay attention to them and that's why i think it's crazy that these people don't want to have these things taught in schools because you know if we're 98 percent emotional we need to really um really hone down on what healthy emotions is exactly know? wow exactly. well what can we do what like as you know, as people that are listening to the show, you know, of course, we're going to use your, you know, all of your tips and, and your processes, but what can we do maybe in society to help this along? Is there anything well, you can recommend? Yeah, I think we, I don't think you have to do big stuff. Um, I, I'll give advice that I've given to advice that I gave to my students during the pandemic. Learn these skills. I'll give you a, a link in a moment to a web page I built for everybody who's listening. Mm -hmm. um, for your audience. To, the only people who will ever get this page are people who are listening to this podcast. Awesome. Uh, but you walk around your neighborhood and you see somebody. Maybe you see a neighbor you know. Maybe it's a person you don't know. And you stop and say, hey, how's it going? And they start talking a little bit and you immediately start epic labeling and just reflect back their emotions to them. And they will smile and be grateful that you validated them, that you listened them into existence. You just dropped a little pebble in the pond and spread a ripple. Do that every day. Mm -hmm. One person, you're just going to sp spread the ripple one day at a time with one person. It takes you 90 seconds to a minute to do it and it costs you absolutely nothing. And you will help yourself because you'll reprogram your brain as you do this. And you'll be spreading a ripple of peace wherever you go. It's that easy. Love it. I love that. And you just don't know, like if we could see into the future and see the next three days of that person's life, I bet you that that little thing that we did for them, you know, just to welcome them into like our vision and say, hey, I know you exist. I wonder then they've gone inside their home and now they're talking to their family members differently. And well, it, it takes a little bit. That's that's a great point. It takes a little bit more than that. Uh, what, what I've learned when working with parents is that when parents learn these skills, those that have wanted to learn them, they they see within a, a couple of weeks that their children are affect labeling them. Mm. So, yes, people do, will pick up, pick it up and, and model, if you model it. But just a one-time interaction that won't that they won't get it but i've i've had that happen to me like i agree with what you're saying but i've had a moment where i remember i'm feeling so alone and so down and, and somebody noticing oh yeah just, yeah that's going to make a difference but what i i think what i was responding to was yes, the idea yes. that people you would affect label somebody right, one right. time and then they all of a sudden would start affect labeling other people no this is a no, skill no. that has to be learned it's like riding a bike yes i just meant it, like Sorry to interrupt you. I certainly would that. certainly yeah. certainly would change. There's no doubt that you could three days later they might still be thinking about that conversation and beaming about it. Absolutely. Yeah, because I know you don't even moment, know what you did. Exactly. Yeah, and like you said, it only takes a moment. Right. Yeah, and then so the, so I came in from this example and then taught talked to my family, spoke to my family in a different way. I wasn't so you know angry about whatever it was that I went outside for some air for 
and right. therefore they then continued that they weren't didn't go to bed upset and they the next day like right. when you were saying the ripple effect i think it's for sure but i agree this is a skill that needs to be taught and you know over time for sure right exactly i love that you know and and it helps us we were talking before we hit record and um you were saying how giving to others helps us tenfold oh yeah and Give to get. It, it's just a beautiful thing. Nobody loses. Everybody wins. No. And this is a precious gift that you can give to anybody and it costs you nothing. Yeah. And the more you do it, the more you want to do it, I find. That's right. It's self-reinforcing and it also reprograms your brain. Hmm. You become You become more and more emotionally competent the more you do this. I've learned a lot. I've taken some notes here today and... <laughs> Well, let me give you the let me give you the URL that I created. So there's a web page. My, first of all, for people that want to contact me, I'm a I work by myself. I don't have a staff. Uh, I'm just me. Doug Doug at DougNoll.com. Website's DougNoll.com, and the page that I created it's the Bitly link. It's DougNoll.co slash Nelia. So people can really easy to remember. DougNoll.co slash Nelia, and on that page. Uh, a free ebook that talks about all of this. You can buy my fourth book, Deescalate, and then I have some video courses if you want more advanced training. That's great. I just, I just want to learn it all so then I can go and teach it now. There you go. <laughs> you know? Well, I, I'll say that if people are interested in learning how to teach this stuff, they should reach out to me. And I do have a training program Fantastic. for how to learn. How to learn? It's, you know, it's learning this stuff you got there's a lot of reading involved there's a lot of knowledge you have to have in order to teach this stuff but but i do have a whole facilitators course set up that i'll talk to people about it they're interested in learning how to do it and you can make some money at it too hmm. because the, the, the way my facilitator course works is i teach you how to facilitate and you bring in students they all buy the course and then you get a you get 50 percent of whatever they buy awesome so that's how you get paid doing the work. That's wonderful. And you're, I mean, you're still doing this, like you're still in it and you're still helping all of these people. And I don't see you slowing down anytime soon. I think it's fantastic. There's no. hope. There's hope out there because Doug's still doing his thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. I mean, I'm not, I'm not slowing down. That's awesome. I'm grateful for that day that things just you know, took a different turn. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not looking, I, I I'm not looking at big grandiose shifts, but like I said, one person at a time. Yeah. And, and one person it is so much. Yeah. If you think of one life, yeah. you know, I think these days we, um, we don't really value one person anymore. You know, um, sometimes people are just numbers or just and if you think of what one life really means and, and remember that and not just, I don't know, everything, I think it's all about numbers and it's all about, you know, all of these things. But when you think of one person who has a mother, who has a brother, who has a sister, who has feelings, who has traumas, who has all of these things and life is so precious and we don't always remember that like in today's world there's so many things going on and right. the love and and the acceptance that we can give by just listening and and what you said you know giving back the you statements i can see that really helping and healing a lot of a lot of things that are going on yep absolutely i got one more question for you sure sometimes ask certain guests that come on the show <laughs> so i'd like to ask you what was the biggest gift you gave to yourself that changed the way you felt about yourself? Sorry to put you on the spot. No, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot there. I think that probably the biggest gift I gave myself was to submit to my emotions and not deny them or repress them or run from them, but to dive deep into the pool of emotions 
And when I did that, I came out the other end a completely different person. Because I was no longer afraid of my emotions. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you, You're Doug. Welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. You know, I think of how this conversation started and you were telling me about, you know, how people weren't equipped to deal with a child who had certain not normal things, you know, and um, how far we want life to, you know, and people to just how far we want people to come. And I don't know, I just, I see, like, I know I've just met you, but I see sort of that transformation. And I love that when I see that in people. You know, you said you used to be arrogant and all these things and how you did the work like you did, you know, this is amazing because you helped yourself and you helped all these other people around you. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. It's there's days that it's hard to do that. So I commend you on all of that stuff. So, yeah, thank Thanks. you. Yeah, it is hard work. There's no question about that. So worth oh, it, right? Oh, yeah. And that's probably the reason why many people don't don't do don't go through that transformation because it is really hard, <clears throat> but it's true. worth it. But it's yeah. still hard. <laughs> that's when you start li really living. That's what you. That's right. After fifty, so I'll be that's fifty right. this year. So let's go. <laughs> the rest. Of the time. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming and you know just explaining all these things to us and making them, explaining them in a way that we can all understand because, you know, there's no point in in, in using all these big words that we don't understand. So. Right. I'm glad that you gave us the steps. You told us, you know, simple form, this is what you need to do. And the results prove themselves, right? The results are there. And right. thank you so much for, for doing all this work in the prison system. I love it. It's something that I've always been fascinated with. So thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. If you enjoyed what you heard, please subscribe or leave a review. See you next week on the Giving Starts With You podcast.